Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. How are you, bud? Doing well, my friend. Doing well. Uh, getting ready for the holidays, and uh, I, I, I uh, it was it was kind of fun listening to um, the, this uh, Elvady Elvady album. Um, just uh, something a little bit different. Um, this this kind of blend of, of like uh, folk symphonic death metal. It, it was uh, it was cool. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yes, so am I. Um... It's interesting, and I'll get into it a little bit more, but I told you what was kind of the genesis, no pun intended. I actually have something to say about them in a little bit, but the genesis of why I chose this album, which when you listen to the entire album, I picked the out, I based it on the Outlier song, right? Like, it's kind of interesting that um, A Rose for Epona was was the reason I chose this, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, anything new that you listened to this week that you think the people might want to hear about? The people. Um, the people. I, I want to I share with the people... Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is a band that I've heard of before, but never really listened to. And I think the reason why is because all of their albums are not in English. And I think that kind of pushed me away. But I found it interesting um, that they released a a, uh, a, co- a Manowar cover of uh, Warriors of the World um, which is kind of one of the, I mean, came out like 20 years ago, but it, it's considered one of the newer Man of War songs because they haven't really released much, um, you know, since probably since um, the uh, the 1996 release. Um, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, I'm pretty sure Hell's involved, but um, <laughs> Louder Than Hell, that's yes, it. Um, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, they've been kind of like a part-time band since then. And so it was interesting that they chose this, but it's cool because there's um, some really fun, uh, you know, guests on here, um, including Melissa Bonnie, who we mention all the time from uh, Ad Infinitum. you got to give the um, name of the band, man. You haven't even said it, and I'll be fun. It's funny. Oh, right. I don't fire, think you can pronounce it. Fi- f- fire Schwanz. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yes, it, it includes Melissa Bonney, uh, Thomas Winkler, the former uh, vocalist for Glory Hammer, and, uh, and here's another name I'm going to butcher, but uh, Sal- Saltatio Mortis. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's funny, like, they actually have a little uh, a little blurb that says, It all started late at night when Hody and Alea from Saltatio Mortis had a cold drink together. Um, how how so, those things start, right? Yeah, t- typically, yes. Um, but this is a really fun, like guest laden, um, and, and this is a band that apparently has like a like I think seven or eight members just to begin with, and then they have these uh, three, um, you know, guests on it. Um, I thought it was a really cool uh, cool cover. Um, so uh, yeah, you sent this to-, to me, and I was like not knowing what to expect, and it was it was. Pretty good. It's probably better than uh, better than the Man of War version. I, I was never a fan of this song, but um, they did a nice job. They did a nice job, and the video is about as cheesy as you'd expect, but you know, still a fun watch for the four minutes or whatever it is. Six. Yeah, minutes. and and so they have an album coming out uh, called Memento Mori, and um, there's going to be a, um, a a special edition that has a bonus disc with cover songs on it, and. Uh, you know, other than the Man of War song, they're also going to do an Amon of Marth, and believe it or not, the uh, the song Drag Dragasta uh, Dragonsta Dinte. I probably butchered that one too, but uh, easy for you the, to uh, say that too, huh? The, the Numa Numa song, as as most people remember it by Ozone, that was the uh, internet sensation in the early two thousand. So that I think metalized would be very interesting to hear. So um, I thought I would. Yeah, I thought I, I would shine a light on that band just because. Um, I, I mean, have, had you you had not heard anything by them either. No, this was a new name for me. I feel like they played Vakin or something like that. Maybe I've seen the name, but I was never familiar with the with the music. Um, the name probably turned me off just because I figured it was not going to be something I could relate to. But uh, nice job with this. I'll I'll check the album out when it comes out next year. Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually very curious about the. Um, the covers, but uh, the sound of the band, I think, it, it is not too far off from from what we're going to talk about today. It, it kind of has that folky kind of uh, symphonic folk kind of. I think this is 
done in a less kind of modern way. It's more of a, a medieval style, but um, either way, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to it. And, and I guess now I'm realizing that Saltasio Mortis is not a person, but a, actually an entire band. Um, so this is quite the quite the group of people they've brought together here. Um, yeah, I guess I learned a thing or two um, from, from just this one Manowar cover. Who would have thought? Um, there you go. Anything, and the, and the anything one else? Other thing, yeah, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Sonata Artica has a um, two volumes of acoustic albums coming out this uh, in 2022 called Acoustic Adventures, and they released the first single, which was originally a, a B-side, uh, The Rest of the Sun Belongs to Me, which I, I have to say, this was during a time where I thought Sonata Artica's B-sides were on par with any of their best, um, you know, album material. And this was one of those songs I, I really liked. And I remember it was included on their first live album, which I thought was interesting. Um, but uh, it's cool. It, it's a totally different take on the song. I know that, like, all of the people that kind of crap on Sonata Arctica and how they've kind of gone soft in the later years are probably not going to love this. But I, I think it's kind of cool to hear some of these songs done in a different style so i'm looking forward to to these albums so those are just two uh two things to check out nice i, I want to mention a couple of things myself first of all i mentioned genesis earlier i actually got to see them in concert this week um which was you know different than uh the abigail williams uh you know swallow the sun show that i saw last <laughs> week to say the least um these guys are so great. I, 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 I was surprised because even though I, I won't say that I was ever a huge Genesis fan, um, I, I, I knew quite a bit of the material that they played and they, they really did span their entire career. And it, it's funny because the, the, the stuff from the early days just sounds so different from that, you know, the eighties material, almost like Rush in a sense, just the way that they've kind of transformed their sound over the years. But it was, it was cool to see. Uh, you know, the band, quote unquote, back together and whatnot. And uh, I got to be honest with you is is obviously, uh, you know, people are, are curious to see Phil Collins and, and it looks like he's, his health is, is getting the best of him at this point. Um, it was still great to see him out there rocking out. And, and Tony Banks and Mike Rutherford are just um, every bit as good as they were 50 years ago. So kudos to them. Really cool show. If it comes by your area, I, I would definitely try to check it out just because – uh, when they say it's the last tour, I, I really do believe that this is going to be the last time to see them. So kudos do they, to do they play any songs from the, the Peter Gabriel era or is it all the, yeah, no, as far as I know, it was all the, uh, it was all the, uh, the old, the older material. Um, it, it's funny because they have some great Peter Gabriel stuff, but both Collins and Gabriel are more known for their solo material at this point, I think than they are for the Genesis material. But, um, the crowd was rocking. They had played two shows at Madison Square Garden earlier in the week, and then they did a third show out on Long Island by me. So it was, um, it, it seems to be drawing quite well. Um, and, you know, so not not too surprising as, as the band hadn't been together in very very long time, decades even. So it's uh, it was a cool show, definitely definitely good to see, and I'm, I'm glad that I went. Yeah, I'm looking at the set list, and it doesn't look like they missed anything I would have wanted to hear. Um, especially Land of Confusion, which is one of my favorites. So Yeah, that was awesome. I have to say that was definitely one of the highlights. So kudos to them, a good show. And just uh, two other items that I thought I'd, I'd mention. One band um, that I had mentioned briefly, uh, I think it was when we did the uh, Dissection episode, and that was uh, Kvain out of um, uh, Sweden. They are a black metal band. They just released their new single, The Great Below, uh, and it actually features a guitar solo from Jeff Loomis, um, guitar player extraordinaire from, you know, obviously with Arch Enemy now, formerly with Nevermore. Uh, a cool black metal song. I'll, I'll post that during the week. I, I don't think I had sent that to you yet, but you'll obviously see that. But one thing I definitely did send to you was some music by a band called Old Gods of Asgard. Uh, and they build themselves as the greatest heavy metal band on the planet, which I thought was kind of ironic. Obviously, it's tongue in cheek, but it features uh, members. Are going to get pissed? Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, I you, 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 you know how they feel about that. Um, they, they, they feature members of Poets of the Fall, which is kind of like, I guess we'll call them a, an alternative band from Finland, who I think. I can speak for both of us. We are both huge fans of it at this point. Uh, I've been listening to them for, for some time, but this is really uh, kind of like a metal project that they've been doing in connection 
with the Alan Wake video game series, which I've never played, but from what I understand has quite the following. Um, so uh, they seem to do the soundtrack in this, you know, metal style. And, and I sent you one of the tracks earlier this week and I just kind of stumbled upon it. This is really good stuff. Yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And, and I think that um, I, I don't know the vocalist name off the top of my head, but his his voice has such a, um, a sonically like pleasing tone to it. It's just so like clear and rich and, and um, it, it, it actually lends really well to, to more of a metal style. So I would definitely be interested in hearing more in that vein. Yeah, and they they are coming out apparently with uh, Alan Wake Two or like a, a follow up to the game, if you will. And I believe they're doing that soundtrack, so I'm going to try to check that out when it comes out in the coming months, just because it, there's enough there that intrigues me. And I, I also love the vocals. I just think that they are so um, clear and and pronounced that there's just something about it which I love. I think he's low key one of the best singers out there, um, and nobody knows of these guys, so I. I I think it'll be a fun listen when, when the album comes out. Yeah, and I could definitely confirm that he is just as good live as he is in the studio after seeing them play at, at Prague Power. That was uh, quite a, a real treat, I thought. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I hope to see them again. They are surprisingly big outside of the U.S., but for whatever reason, never hit it here. Uh, Poets of the Fall, that is. And it's funny because when I when I listen to them, I say to myself, this is a band that should be blowing up mainstream radio here in the states because of that just catchy clear uh you know alt rock sound that they have it's it, it there's something for everybody there i think that whenever somebody listens to them for the first time they they kind of fall in love right away yeah I, that's been my experience and people that i um that i know are, are just like diehard metalheads love this band so it's interesting how that crossover has kind of made it um to the point where they're playing at a, at a heavy metal festival and, and nobody really, I think, batted an eye at that. No, and in fact, they went over quite well, I have to say. So, um, you know, something interesting. And, and honestly, I, we probably should do a Poets album one of these days just to uh, do a deeper dive into one of them. And they certainly have a lot of material to choose from. But that's the story for another day. This week, we do Elevati's uh, Helvetios, which came out in 2012. And as I had mentioned earlier, the reason why I chose this album is I had been shuffling some music. Uh, a Rose for Epona comes on, and I was like, wow, I had never heard this track. Uh, I wasn't as familiar with their back catalog as I should be, obviously, because I've never heard this album. And I just thought, you know what, let's, let's, let's choose this one this week. I loved their most recent release from... Uh, 2019. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic album, and I didn't know really how to compare the Anna Murphy material to to the newer stuff they had been doing. And you know what? I just figured let's dive in. So before we kind of go track by track or, or do our review, what were your overall thoughts of this album, and how familiar were you with the band? Uh, I was like fairly familiar, um, not super familiar. Um, I have like gone out of my way to get to getting all of their albums. I think probably from this one moving forward. And, um, I, I give credit to my friend Caleb who um, brought them to my attention. Um, you know, I wasn't really too, uh, knowledgeable as far as folk metal bands go. Um, when I had met Caleb and, and I met him shortly before this album was released. So this was definitely on my radar when it came out. I probably, I, I definitely gravitated more towards the songs with the clean vocals in them. And um, I, I know I definitely uh, would use a couple of uh, videos from this album and, and from the band moving forward on power hours, which I think was why um, some of them were more familiar to me than others, but uh, definitely one of those bands that I think we would have not uh, paid much attention to in high school. Um, but I think with, you know, the, the ever expansion of our metal minds. Um, I think uh, it's definitely more palatable to me uh, as an older adult than it, it would have been years ago. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I would have never listened to these guys 
you know, 20 years ago. I, I wouldn't have, I would have completely skipped over it. And, and to be honest with you, I kind of skipped over some of their earlier material when they were hitting it big, you know, in the earlier start of their career or whatever. Uh, but I guess I'm at the point now where I look for that diversity and I just look for things that are a little bit different. Um, and, and I am really kind of enjoying what I hear overall. Um, the band started in 2002 uh, and, and they've been going ever since. And they've had a lot of kind of success over the years with a ton of U.S. tours and, and tours really all over the world. And despite numerous, and I mean too many to name, lineup changes, guest musicians that have done a lot of uh, you know guest spots in terms of vocals and, and different you know instruments and whatnot, they are still going strong and you know, they don't seem to be slowing down. They're obviously due for a new album. I've not seen them live. I definitely, definitely will check them out next time they come to town because I feel like they would probably put on a massive live show. Uh, but, you know, it just just a really, really interesting band. And I guess the best way I would describe this is it's melodic death metal meets folk, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's folky melodic death metal. That's what this is, in my opinion, just summed up in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, it's been a while since I listened to their most recent release, uh, a, a Ten Natos. Man, I am just getting reamed today with uh, <laughs> pronunciations. But um, do you do you remember it being as death vocally? Vocally, I, I feel like it was a little more. Um, yeah, yeah. Or I, I was just gonna say, um, you know, accessible to people who are not as big a fan as the death vocals. I felt like there was maybe more of that on Helvetios. Um, but I, I honestly, it's been. I, th- I don't think I've listened to their re- most recent release um, since it came out, so I don't really it's, remember. It's 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 heavy. I mean, it is really heavy. I think it, I think the new release has a couple of things going for it without doing a full deep dive into the, their newest album. I thought the production was cl- crystal clear. And I thought that that's one of the things that kind of lacked on this particular release uh, that we're covering. I thought the production got much better over time. Uh, I thought that the, uh, the, the use of um, h- how do I explain this? Well, I'll say it this way. Fabian Ernie, who is the clean vocalist now, and she's been with the band since 2017, I thought they used her better on the newer release than they did Adam Murphy's vocals on this particular album. Um, there were highlights of her, of, of Adam Murphy on this album, and, and we'll, I'll get into those in detail as we start covering it. But I feel like that they let, they let Fabian shine more on the newer release, and it was almost, and again, I, I'm just, Making this up, but it's almost like Krigo Glansman, the, the, the brainchild of this band and, and the, the person who does a fantastic job with his harsh vocals. It's almost like he was willing to take more of a back seat in spots, uh, to Fabian. Whereas at maybe this time in 2012, he really just kind of drove the ship and, and steered the ship, uh, you know, for the band. Again, I'm just making this up, but to me, I heard more of him taking a little bit of a back seat in spots on the newer stuff. Whereas here, I think he was, you know, he was the captain of the ship and he was driving this thing and he just let everyone come along for the ride. Yeah, I agree. I I didn't realize that Anna Murphy's, um, not really a big, uh, like featured a lot on this album. She she almost feels more like a, um, like a guest. Um, I agree. My understanding is that this was kind of like the first album where she was starting to kind of, crack her way um, into things and, and she definitely has uh, some songwriting credit on um, some of the songs uh, on this album but uh, and, and I'm sure we'll get into it but there was like a massive massive rift where you know three of the band members left and, and, and started Cellar Darling which I'm sure again we'll, we'll mention but uh, I, I did enjoy what, what she did um, contribute to this album yeah, I think that that's what takes it and, and really kind of pushes it. I don't want to say over the top. That would be the wrong thing, but it really does a nice, uh, the contrast or, or her contribution to this album is really what made it for me. And I was surprised because having not heard it, uh, the, the album that made, or I should say the song that made me really choose this album was such an outlier and so different from the rest of this album that it was almost like 
you know what? It's it's uh, it kind of led me down a path I wasn't expecting at all, and and I'm happy, and I'm I'm certainly happy I chose it, but for reasons that were not what I was expecting when I chose it. If that makes sense. Yes, and I agree completely. Um, it, I mean, it's kind of nice because I like that the album has a lot of different layers to it. Um, but I would have preferred more rose for opponents versus more, you know, lux doses. Yeah, well, there you go. So let's get into it. It starts with a spoken word prologue for about an hour, for about a minute and a half. An hour. Um, yeah, it was it was a really long introduction. No, um, well, what's interesting to me though is you know I, I remember criticizing Mercy Falls by Seventh Wonder and the spoken word parts on that album. I, it really took me out of the moment. It was the complete antithesis on this album. The spoken word sections, which were done by uh, Alexander Morton, were fantastic. And his Scottish accent, like, I I just love it. And I just wanted to hear him speak. And he just set the tone for this entire concept album. That's what happens when you get somebody who's an actual actor. Yes. (laughs) To do your, yes, yes. yes. Your, your, uh, your spoken, you know, your spoken word parts. Uh, This is a guy who's, um, who's done film, stage, and television acting, trained at the London at Central School of Speech and Drama. Um, I'm guessing maybe they were working with a little bit more of a budget than Seven Wonder. Right? I but, would um, certainly say so. I, all I could picture was Davos from Game of Thrones um, doing this, this speech, like getting yes. me all... It really does get you hyped up for the album, and it kind of... What's good about it is that I think it... it it kind of makes you feel like you're ready to hear the the style of music you're about to hear because of the story that that's being told. And so um, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I really think it, it kind of sucks you right in and having somebody who's a, a trained actor, I think makes such a, such a difference. And, you know, cause there's so many instances of goofy narration in, in the metal world. And, and uh, you know, then when you think of like, Bands like Manowar and Rhapsody using Christopher Lee to like take it to a whole new level, and, and Rhapsody, you know, had some pretty goofy narrators prior to bringing Christopher Lee on board, which I think changed the whole. It almost changes the whole perspective of of the the album because if it starts out with this this like a real actor, you can I feel like you just take it more seriously exactly. going into it, and it doesn't seem like this kind of jokey kind of cheesy thing so um i think it's a hell of a way to to kick things off on this album i i think it made all the difference and then they go into the title track and right away if you've never heard this band this is the band in a nutshell right it, it is melodic death metal with heavy folk elements throughout and i have to say and and this i i guess is really a testament to 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 Kringle's vocals He's a phenomenal, harsh vocalist. He, the, he's excellent at what he does, not just because he can hold the note, but the way he bends his notes and the way he's able to like kind of carry certain notes while sounding like you know he's in the middle of a war is just phenomenal. And what 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 really kind of I, I guess struck me right away is this is a a Swiss band that is doing a concept album which is really just Celtic in nature. And I thought that that was kind of interesting and cool. Um, it, it was it was not what I was going to expect, although obviously it certainly sounds very similar to their, their newer material in terms of, you know, the, the, the aggression and the, the, the folk elements and whatnot. But um, very, very interesting band and, and kind of an interesting decision to go in this direction for a band from, you know, the middle of Europe. Definitely. Um, I just think that also, though, that like, I think that Celtic style is something that people from all over the world can kind of get on board with. I I even just find Celtic folk music outside of the world of metal to just be very, um, just very interesting and catchy. And I love just all of the different instruments, like, you know, the different pipes and whistles and, and, and of course the, the hurdy gurdy, which, um, you know, is in full force here. Um, Oh my god! It, it marries so well with the with the the aggressive guitar and the aggressive vocals. It, it's it's really a, a very cool um, mixture of styles, and I think it works really well. And I think that Elvedi probably does it better than anybody. 
Yeah, they, they, I, I'd agree with that. Um, you mentioned the guitars. You have, uh, Evo Henze on, uh, rhythm guitar, Simeon Koch, uh, playing leads. They're kind of the driving force between the metal side of this. One, one comment I'll make off the bat, and, and I'll just say it now, but it really applies to the rest of the album. I thought the low end was kind of lacking here in, in terms of you really don't hear, um, K. Brem's bass at all on this thing. Like, it's just not in the mix. I thought I was listening to Injustice for All. You can't hear the bass. Um, and, and the drums, you know, Merlin Sutter's drums, in spots, they stand out in one or two tracks in particular. But for the most part, it wasn't the driving force behind this. It was really the the, 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 the guitars that were mixed at a much higher end. But it made for like a muddy sound. And I didn't love the production on this album. I think they did a much better job on the on the most recent effort i think it might have something to do with just the number of instruments involved because like you know a typical heavy metal album you're dealing with you know two guitars a bass you know vocals drums possibly a keyboard um but here there's so many you know you got a harp a harp and a tin whistle and a low whistle and uh uli and pipes and a mandala and <laughs> A hurdy gurdy, and I don't even know what half these things are. I had to. I know. Them neither do I. There's fiddles. There's bagpipes. Um, it, it, it's there's a lot going on. It, it's almost part of me wonders if the the battery was kind of hidden on purpose to kind of put more focus on all of the the more Celtic style instruments. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I didn't really, it didn't really ring out to me that there that the mix was. Um, was off or anything you're usually you usually have a better ear for that than i do but um i just think there's there's so much other stuff going on it was kind of hard for me to even like pick it out yeah maybe because i didn't listen to it on headphones maybe that would have made it uh, a little more apparent but um i felt like yeah the, for sure the the guitars and the different um celtic instruments were definitely being uh showcased more than anything else I, I will say that although this is a really representative track, I will say that it's not my favorite track on the album. I think there's better stuff um, later on. Uh, I, I think that the song itself grew on me over the week, you know, as I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. And, and that first listen, I have to say, just throughout the album, a lot of this stuff kind of blended into each other. And I couldn't really distinguish between tracks that well, that first listen. But as I gave it more and more listens. And that's part of the reason why I, I give these albums, you know, multiple listens during the week. Stuff really started to stand out and pop for me more with multiple listens, but it took time. Um, you know, going into this, the next track, Luxtos, much, a, a, a touch slower, uh, with, with a real very catchy folk intro kind of reminded me of River Dance, uh, with, with <laughs> just like what was going on here. Uh, the bagpipes and the heavy riff that starts it was, made this track really pop to me more than, than the prior track. Um, the chorus is really, really catchy, albeit I don't have a clue um, what, what they're saying. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I actually heard a lot of Orphan Land in this track. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can see that completely. Um, I, I didn't – to me, like, this song didn't really – differentiate itself much more from the the previous track um but i mean which is fine i agree with you like i find that most of the songs that were done in this style were hard to differentiate no joke at one one of the times i listened to the album this week i was i was working and i didn't even realize the album ended the next album origin started playing and i made it all the way to track seven of Origins before I realized I wasn't listening to Helvetios anymore. I'm like, man, this is a long album. No, I listened to the, the first half of the next album. Uh, so, yeah, How that's was it? what happened. It was, well, I we couldn't tell. It was just as good as Helvetios. <laughs> I thought it was Helvetios. So um, I guess, you know, there's something to be said there. But uh, I, but it's just, I think it's just a kind of enjoyable, again, just hearing that kind of blend of different styles come together and, and it's done so well. Um, I think there's more of like, um, you hear more of like that, the kind of uh, the, the background chorus in the song, which yes. is another thing that you're going to notice um, throughout the album in, in parts. So, um, but yeah, this was um, pretty much, I think more of the same from the, the, the title track that, 
preceded it. And to your point, I think it's important. I'm glad you mentioned it. The, the background chorus, which I think is led by by Anna Murphy, it blends itself so well with the harsh vocals that I love when they do it together. And I wish they would have done it more on the disc because I notice it and it pops for me every time that it I hear it. But for some reason, it was not employed generously. It was here in spurts, but not uh, it didn't permeate the entire album. And I'm, I'm not saying it should have, but it could have. And I think it would have been well served to do that. Um, the next track is Home. This is kind of the epic track on the album. And I, I use that loosely. One of the things I do like about the album is that the tracks are kind of short. You're in, you're out, you're on to the next one, even if they do sound similar in spots. This track, Home, is the epic track. It's over five minutes long. It's the only track on the album, which uh, is quite frankly over four and a half minutes, let alone five minutes. Um, it's it's how do I? It, it it has another again folky intro, but the song really picks up with the verses. I found this song to be kind of unremarkable, except ironically the drums, which I mentioned earlier. This was one of the few spots, especially in the instrumental section, where the drums stood out for the first time. Yeah, I. I... I don't know that I have much more to add. I think what you said pretty much sums it up. Um, it, it, again, like I, it, the, now we're like three tracks in a row where I'm having like kind of a hard time differentiating from, from one to the other. And, and, you know, I don't listen to a lot of folk metal, so I, I don't want to say that like as an indictment of the album. It, it just not, isn't really like my um, usual fare. Uh because I do enjoy these tracks, but I just have a hard time kind of finding parts that make one song seem obvious that it's that song versus the ones previous um, until, you know, we get to whatever songs will mention it, obviously that there's a, um, a difference. But since the narration opening up the, the album, we've kind of been on the same style of, of music, I think, um, all the way through. And now, you know, we're about, 13, 14 minutes into the album. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And I would actually throw the next track in there as well. It's a little bit, it's in the same vein, but it's a little bit, I guess I would say more upbeat sounding, even though it's obviously got the same type of vocals. That song is Santonian Shores. I popped every time I heard this. I think of the first kind of like four real songs on the album. This to me was probably my favorite. And and I what I really hear here, and, I, and there's, a couple of times where I noticed this, if you take out the folk elements, this is a soil work song. This is soil work with, and then you just add the hurdy gurdy and some of the other uh, instruments on the top. I, I like this track a lot. I thought it had a really cool bridge that connect the verses and the choruses. Uh, and and here again, you're in, you're out, and it's not like overly self indulgent, which I thought was nice because a lot of the times we listen to this prog stuff, which is. You know, it kind of goes on. There's an instrumental section. It goes back to the chorus, another instrumental section. Here, you're in, you're out, you're on to the next song. And I, I, I really liked that style. Uh, you know, it was a nice contrast for me. But I thought this was probably the best of the four tracks. Yeah, I would argue that soil work has always been in need of more hurdy-gurdy. But um, <laughs> I do, again, like I, I love how these songs kind of start start out with just like so many different instruments that you're you're not used to hearing listening to you know your typical metal album um and again it kind of like goes into that that same you know that same type and like you said before like i think that more of a mixture of the vocals would have made i think may have made things a little bit more interesting um that's just personal preference for me i i happen to generally enjoy female clean female vocals more than clean male vocals or, or harsh male vocals. But um, so like, and I really love when there's male and female vocals together, because I feel like not a lot of bands employ that. Um, I think of, you know, um, like Marco becoming a, a, a big part of Nightwish as kind of, um, kind of a taste of that or, or just Epica in general. Um, but just like getting that, taste of that beauty and the beast as they say uh sound uh, this album needed more beauty and less beast in my opinion yeah i, I I'm, I'm with you um the next track is a nice transition point or you you finally get the taste of something different and i was shocked when i heard it because it goes on for like over four minutes i don't know that it necessarily needed to be that long but scorched earth 
really kind of starts with this. I, I guess the easiest way to describe it is like this chant, uh, if you will, obviously not in English, um, where it just kind of serves as a transition or breaks up the monotony of the songs that come before it. Again, a very strong orphan land influence here. It almost sounds Hebrew to me, although I, it's obviously not. Um, just an interesting track that, again, I think it's very important to help the flow of the album. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I thought it was a little long. Um, I mean, I'm used to like when you hear a song like this on an album as it being kind of like an interlude where it might be like a minute or something. Um, but uh, I, I think it's interesting just to talk about the style. Um, the, the vocalist was um, Christoph Pelgen, and it's known as, as Gwert's, um, Gwert's vocals. And so I, I kind of wanted to look into that because I don't know what it means, but um, it's, a, it's a, a, a type of folk song of, of Brittany, uh, which is um, the farthest west of the regions of metropolitan France. Um, you're going to get a little bit of history lesson. Here, so <laughs> hang in there. Um, and it's defined as, um, a, as a song that tells a story, which can be epic, historical or mythological. The stories are usually of a tragic nature and are characterized by often monotonous melody and many couplets, um, all in the, the Breton language. Um, Historically sung unaccompanied, but some modern musicians use limited instrumentation with it. So um, you're, you're definitely, I mean, that really describes the song pretty well. You're definitely getting some of the, the flutes and pipes uh, going on with the the vocals here, but um, no, no guitars, no drums, nothing, none of those like heavy metal elements. And I thought, I agree with you, I thought it was a much needed kind of change of pace from the first a uh, few tracks, but I also kind of was like, thought it went on a little bit long. Um, Probably didn't need to be four minutes. I think yeah, it reminded me of some of, of, of almost like a native American kind of style. Um, I, I guess that's kind of, uh, yeah, like a, like a native American chant, I guess. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely hear that now that you mention it. Um, different, but well, again, I, I will say well placed after four, you know, songs of a kind of a similar vein. Um, and then I think that it also serves the purpose of the next track that comes after it kind of pops a little bit more because it's contrasted to this style, which is so different. The next track being Meet the Enemy. And I, I just call this like a great pick-me-up track. Uh, it's one of the few tracks that really doesn't have a folk intro at the very beginning. And, and that instrumentation throughout, again, just screams soil work to me. Um, uh, obviously the folk elements would come in a little bit later, but it's not at that, you know, not, not, the, not the first notes that you hear by any means, uh, really, really fun track. And I would think that, um, it was kind of cool because Anna Murphy actually uses harsh vocals here as well, which was different for her. She uses it on two different tracks on the album. Um, this was one of the ones that I would want to see live if I was going to see the band live. I think it's probably a great live tune. I know they used to play it, um, Back in the day, when they were touring for this album, they played almost the whole thing, if not the entire thing, live, which I think was kind of cool. But now they only play one or two tracks from it during their live shows. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that has something to do with the band members that are no longer in the band. But True. Um, True. Uh, yeah, this song, I like that. It just kind of gets right right to business, like right from the beginning, like uh, which is good because I don't think it needed a real instrumental intro after having that you know, four-minute um I mean, that Scorched Earth song really was just kind of an instrument. It's like an instrumental interlude, but just with those with those vocals um, laid over it. So I think it was time to just get right back into things, and, and they didn't waste any time. Um, yeah, I think this was... I want to say this was one of the songs I was fairly uh, aware of going into the album, and I like the little parts where, like the vocals kind of kick out and then you just hear more of those, those Celtic instruments and, and the way they're played in such a fast fashion is, is so like fun to me. I, I, I agree with you. I, I would definitely like to uh, see this band live as I never have. I, it'd be great to see them at, at Prague power. I don't know if it's kind of like um, they play the, they, they do the U S enough that it's like not really a draw for, for them to play at Prague power, but um. 
And, and you don't really see a ton of folk bands of prog power, unfortunately. Um, I don't know that we've seen any. And to be honest, I, I actually had them on my list for this year. I, I'm not saying they're going to play next year. I, I'm not saying that at all. But to me, they'd be the perfect like direct support to the opener, You know, playing for a nice hour and a half type of thing. I think they'd go over really well, especially with – you know, those that like the, the little bit heavier style. Um, but and as much as I want to see them there, to me, this is the this is the band that has to be on 70,000 tons again. I want to see this on the boat in the middle of the high seas, right? Like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I think it would be. Oh, hi. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to me, it would be phenomenal. Um, and, and speaking of the high seas, we, we get to Neverland. This, to me, is like the soundtrack for Pirates of the Caribbean, right? I want to be in Disney World. I want this playing over the loudspeaker. Um, very much an Ailstorm feel during the chorus, like very much so. I, I almost thought it was an Ailstorm song. Um, and it also reminded me a bit of Haggard, who we'd covered, uh, you know, back in the archives. Um, a cool track, which which kind of leads into the second half of the album. I can't get the thought of like hearing Elvady at Disney World out of my head now that you mention it. Maybe that would make the lines a little shorter. Um, I wouldn't complain about that either. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is good. I mean, you hear Neverland, you think Peter Pan. I mean, that's the first thing that pops in, a, to my, to my, in my head. Um, but uh, yeah, th- I think this is just another kind of in the style of the, the earlier tracks as well. Um, yeah, more of the same for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally... don't think that there's been so far one song that I've not liked on this album, but I just, you know, like I've said, um, it's a lot of similar so- uh, sounding things to me. But uh, Enjoyable, but unremarkable, I guess is the way I would kind of describe it. Like nothing I would turn off. I really liked it, but nothing that's just screaming like i gotta repeat that i gotta play that particular track again is the way i would describe it um whereas we get to either we'll call it the end of side one or the start of side two with the with the one real ballad that we've heard so far a rose for epona um as i said this is a phenomenal tune and i could have easily made this my track of the week um it's certainly the track that that started the episode um it's so well placed, and and I guess it, it's so so catchy that it makes me wonder why they didn't utilize Anna's vocals more as as, as a lead vocalist. She, you, she's got lines throughout the first half of the album, and you hear her in the background. But this is where she comes, you know, front and center. And I guess it's really why I love Sol- Seller Darling, right? Because she's a she's an underrated vocalist with a unique style that just lends itself beautifully to this, you know, Celtic or, you know, this folky music. And I didn't even know that she does some of the the harsh vocals too, um, which I thought was interesting. Because I mean, I don't know. I guess she probably does them in, in Cellar Darling as well. I didn't really notice her doing it when we saw them live. Um, but uh, yeah, she has a very unique and and awesome style, I think. And it's it's nice to hear her have a kind of a, a you know a, a spotlight um for this tune here and um this is a song i definitely knew going into it um probably the song i knew the the best and uh i like this song a lot it might be my song of the week i haven't decided yet um within temptation but, uh, vibe here i i think I, I, which 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 is part of the reason i think you probably lend yourself to to liking it as much as you do but the way she bends the notes and the way she just uses the different inflection is like beautiful i just think it's so well done i i 
I would love to hear this song live as well, just because I think it's a really, really cool. And for those that have like the deluxe edition, this was the bonus track. She does an acoustic version of this, which is phenomenal as well. And, and I think again, um, I haven't listened to their most recent album in a while, but I feel like there were more songs that were done like this. Yes. Um, on the newer album with, with, uh, Fabian, um, with her vocals. Um, she definitely, I think was given more of a spotlight, um, with the band that, than Anna was on, on this, uh, album. And I don't know if that had any, any bearing on her, um, leaving the band. Maybe she just thought she deserved more of a, more, more of a spotlight, but, um, this song certainly makes a strong case for that. And and maybe it's why I enjoyed the new album more than I did this one. Not that this is bad, but just because there, there was that diversity there, which really, I think, lent itself to, to my enjoyment for sure. Um, but I, I, I will say that it marks a bit of a transition towards the end of the album. And I say that because the, the, the end of the album is a little, not quirkier, but there is a little bit more of the up and down uh, to it, whereas it's the first one is just kind of like a train driving kind of straight. Uh, the next track is a band called Havoc, and they still play this live. Also, again, another folk intro here, but there's a scream at the beginning, which is just <laughs> absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love it. And then it slows down a bit before the verses kick in, which is kind of a nice touch. And and I, I don't know how else to say it. This song kicks ass. And this, this is going to be my song of the week. It's heavy. It's melodic. It has fantastic harsh vocals, but it has all the other elements, which makes uh, the man, the, the 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 band great. And I can totally understand why they made a video for it because this, to me, is probably the best of the harsh tracks on the album. Yes, I uh, I'm with you there, and I love I love when these, you know the 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 fiddle and 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 the the whistles and the and the um the hurdy gurdy when they're played at like top speed like this. I think it's so cool. Um, so not just that all the heavy elements that you mentioned, but just also all the folk elements too are like. I like them played at this tempo. I think yeah, it's just, it's, it, it gets you pretty amped up. Like I could totally see, you know, running into war with a big, like, you know, mace in your hand, getting ready to, you know, you know, slap somebody over the head with <laughs> some sort of medieval weapon. But uh, yeah, a good choice Great. for your song of the week. Definitely. Uh, and, and it just like comes out guns a blazing too. The song just starts out like, you know, like let's go, um, which is good. Cause I think that, is a nice um, transition from the previous song, which is a little bit more mid tempoed and, and obviously with a completely different vocal style. So um, yeah, and, very, and very cool track. It's fun because to me, the two best songs of the album are right in the middle. And normally that's usually up front or, or, you know, you know, they, they, they want to catch you right away, but here without question, my favorite tracks are kind of smack dab in the middle of the album, which is, not the way it usually works. So I, I thought that was right. cool. Well, I think the fact that it's that it's a concept album probably has something to do with that because you know the telling the story the way that they want to tell it from a musical perspective is more important than you know sucking you in um, totally from the beginning. Um, of course. I would listen to a guy speak in Scottish about medieval warfare <laughs> more times than a lot of metal albums. So, uh, you know, that's, I think that was a hell of a way to suck you in in a completely different way. You're right. And, and if, ironically enough, he's actually back to advance the story in the next track called the uprising. Um, uh, 
here I thought the verses kick up, but they're uh, I, something about this track never really um, grabbed me. I found it to be kind of unremarkable, at least compared to the last two. Power metal, a little bit power metal sounding, and just in terms of like it's it's fast, not as heavy, but like just kind of reminded me of like a more of a power metal track than it did like a melodic death metal track, if you will. Not my favorite track on the album by any means. It's kind of unremarkable. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, kind of there. And, and and you know, get, going back to the fact that this is a concept album, I, I sometimes I feel like there's songs like this kind of like they get it's like a disservice to the song almost because like it's probably just you know a, a more of a of a of a you know a transition in the story and i don't know that i'm just you know speculating but um so like you end up with songs that are just kind of like almost filler um and again like good filler but you know still like you said nothing that's like truly remarkable but uh I'm sure we're going to get people that disagree, especially if they're like big fans of this kind of style of music. I mean, um, we're kind of noobs in this in this world. Yeah, but um, and, and to be clear, I really enjoy it. I just don't see yeah, that I it's like so. it's 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 weird because the way I'm describing it, I'm probably I probably seem like I'm glossing over certain things, but in a way, it's actually a testament to the fact that I liked it. Um, I don't know. It's it's a weird contrast. Uh, and, and what's also kind of interesting is. It takes them, you know, a dozen tracks for them to have a, their first completely instrumental interlude, which I thought was interesting. And that's the song Hope. Um, not not as cheesy as like a Rhapsody inter, interlude, and I, but you still have to kind of be in the mood for something like this. And, and by and large, this week, I suppose I was, which I really, really liked. And to your point from earlier, I thought this song sounded better than a lot of the other stuff on the album and maybe that's just because there was fewer tracks in the mix but i thought you could hear the instrumentation a lot better on this one including at one point a washboard or what sounded like something scratching in the background very subtle but i thought it actually made the song really really interesting and i I actually thought this was a kind of an underrated gem towards the back of the album yeah and uh any song with a recorder in it is always uh always brings me back to playing hot cross buns in first grade. So um, I I thought, you know, in all honesty, I felt like this album could have used something like this earlier, like in the first half, maybe to break up some of the, the songs um, that, that all kind of ran together just to kind of break things up a little bit. Um, But yeah, I I thought this was nicely uh, placed and kind of gives you a little bit of a breather from a lot of the, the aggressive, um, tunes that that have gone on so far and again like if you're a fan of of these um celtic instruments this is just another kind of uh showcase of of that style and um yeah i I suppose you do have to be in a certain mood to listen to it but um it's definitely cool and i feel like they would have done themselves a disservice by making the entire album just like Helvetios and, and Luxtos all the way through. I oh, mean, it, yeah. would have been, it would have been enjoyable, but I think it's just some of these more varied, um, different styles make it more interesting. And I think that <clears throat> as a band, I think that they kind of realize that. And that's why they, I think they kind of mix it up a little bit more later on in their careers. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is just very good, uh, a very good little instrumental interlude. And and I think it also helps make the next song, which is probably the most brutal track on the album, pop that much more. It's it's under three minutes. It's called The Siege, and it is just a very, very heavy song. But it shows the contrast again here between the two singers because Adam Murphy is just screaming in the background, but it actually provides a really nice touch on this track. I um I, I had the earbuds in, and at one point it almost surround it almost sounded like surround sound to me, which was really, really cool. Um I just, I think it's a really, another example of you're in, you're out, and it's so short, but it didn't need to be any longer. It's just a really cool track. I thought The Siege was one of the better tracks on the album as well. Yeah, and and you know what? Like, I don't think that they would have, it would have been a bad thing to have more of her doing these harsh vocals throughout the album too, just for a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a dichotomy vocal wise, um, because I think it's done well here. Um there was a, a review 
by Stormbringer in Austria that compared this track to the style of Sepultura, which is a um, Brazilian band that I'm not super familiar with, but um, I That's thought that cool. was inter- like an interesting comparison because you know you've mentioned a number of different bands that you that this album kind of reminded you of, and so they, I just thought I'd throw a throw another one and uh they also called the entire album a piece of art which i, I think is pretty much just as as positive of, of a review in, in three words as anybody could possibly ask for well well said and i'm gonna throw one other band into the mix with our next track alessia um and that's evanescence it, it, it starts with this kind of like dark piano sound over orchestration which is um, really, really cool. And I thought it was well done. Uh, eventually harsh vocal is going to kick in, uh, you know, a little bit later in the song. And I just, again, I love when you have either the cleans or the growls combined with the, the male growls here. I think it's really, really cool. And what I found myself finding is that I think I like the second half of this album more than the first. Um, this is another really, really awesome song. And I have to say, uh, there's this outro, which is probably the best outro on the album, where you have these chanting vocals, which is almost church-like in nature. Uh, another fantastic tune, and, and they're kind of, at least for me, they, they've kind of, with four or five out of the last six tracks, they've really hit kind of, you know, home runs. Yeah, I agree with you that the I, I enjoyed the second. I just think that there's there's more variation in the second half of the album, and it feels more... Um, like there's just different things going on and not the same kind of, and, and again, maybe that was the goal. Um, but, uh, I do like that there's a little bit more variation. Um, this is a good, a really good song. I like this a lot. And I love the, I just love the, like you said, the, um, the heavy vocals for, from Chagrel with like laid over Anna's clean vocals. I think that they missed an opportunity to do more of this throughout the album. Um, again, might not have been their artistic vision, but I, it's just what I personally would have liked to have heard more of. And um, I, you're, I'm going to l- let you pronounce the next track. I've embarrassed myself enough in this episode. So uh, I was, I was you afraid have, you were going to say unless that. Unless you have more to say about this track, but uh, I'm not even going to touch this one. Like, so it, I, I, I've, so there's two in a row here, which I struggle with, but I'll, I'll Tulianum, and that's what I'm going with. And correct me if I'm wrong, a very, very short transitional track. Uh, spoken words here, um, not really just a, 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 a precursor to what I'll call the final musical piece on the album, which is, wait for it, Axel Donnan, <laughs> I think. Uh, this, I, I, I'm going to just go with Axel Donnan because I can't say it. It's a mid-paced closer of not the greatest track, but yet a fitting end to the album. Um I, I, I don't have much to say about it other than it kind of reminds me of some of the stuff that was in the first half of the album, uh, but it does pick up speed the second half of the song, and I thought that that was a nice contrast, and ultimately the, the album ends with a more spoken word outro, uh, which again, I guess is fitting because you're just kind of going full circle with the way you started, and then this like folky instrumental section that takes you out, and, and again... To me, it's Frontierland at Disney World through and through to end this album. But it's it's cool. It's it's well done, um, and and it just provided for a, a, a an enjoyable experience, and I enjoyed it every time I listened to it. Yeah, um, I thought that the last like musical track uh, again. I'm not even going to pronounce it. It reminds me of that SNL sketch where the guy from uh, the Knicks is covering the Rangers, and the, and he goes, uh, he's looking at. Um, Brady Shea's jersey, and he goes, there's an S, a K, and a J all in a row, so that's a nope. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's a great skit, and, and and to be honest with you, that's how I feel every time I've tried to slog my way through some of these. Yeah, these but I actually, I did enjoy this track quite a bit. Um, I, I don't think it was super different than some of the other tracks in the album, but again, it, it I like that it just, after that little, it, that quick 20-second track, leading into it um it gets right into it with the the fast-paced uh celtic instrumentation and then you know again we got um some more of the these awesome uh narrations from alexander morton to kind of close things out and maybe that should have been my clue that the album was coming to an end before i let origins play for 
25 minutes. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I agree with you. Just a very overall uh, enjoyable experience, if not a little bit on the um, like one note kind of side of things as far as like some of those are, like first few tracks. It took a while for the variation to kind of kick in. But, um, you know, overall, I'm, I'm glad you chose this because, again, I don't know that I would have gone back and listened to it um you know, otherwise, and I'm glad I did because um, it's definitely opened my my ears to to wanting to hear more from from this band because there's a lot of uh, a lot of talent, and even though you know several of the members have, have since left, um, Shigral Glansman, who's pretty much been the 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 brainchild of this band from the start, is still there and, and providing the the bulk of the the songwriting, to my understanding. Um, so yeah, uh, cool band. Um, I think we should probably briefly just um, just mention, you know, what would end up happening as far as um, the, the band members kind of picking up and 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 leaving. Um, what what ended up happening was um, Anna Murphy, along with um, I just want to make sure I get the the band members uh, correctly. Yeah, so Merlin Sutter, Anna Murphy, and Evo Henze were the the three members that um, left the band. Um, and and basically, what happened was um, Merlin Sutter was, I guess, asked to leave the band, and uh, Anna and and uh, Evo chose to go with him. Um, and in a, I guess a, a sign of solidarity, and so um, they started the band Seller Darling. Um, Nicole Ansperger, who was originally in the band and I believe is, um, I believe that she is Chagrel's, uh, or, uh, Chagrel's, um, wife or girlfriend. Um, she had left the band, um, but then had, so this was her coming back. Um, Elaine Ackerman would replace Merlin, um, Michalina, uh, Malice would replace Anna and uh, Jonas Wolf would replace Evo. And, um, and then uh, as well as um, the, the addition of uh, Fabian Ernie, who I think is a, a wonderful vocalist. I enjoy her quite a bit. And um, I especially like what she did with the band Aluma shade that um, started in, in 2019 as kind of like a, um, a side project for her. Um, where I think that you, you can get to hear more of her, um, her vocals, uh, like, you know, more of a, a, her like leading the way. Um, so cool stuff there. Um, that was, um, they released, uh, I think one album so far. And, um, I, I remember it received a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of positive. Uh, I saw it on a lot of um, best of twenty twenty lists. Um, I don't remember if it was on on mine, but um, I don't think it was. But it probably made it pretty close. Uh, I enjoyed it. They've released a handful of uh, of individual tracks um, over the course of the last two years as well. Um, so some cool stuff that has kind of splintered off of the uh, Elvady band. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Well said, well said. Um, but I, I have not heard your track of the week, so I'm curious to see where you're going to go with that. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go with Rose for Epona, um, not just because it has the name of Link's horse in it, <laughs> but um, I just think that it's a song that, by its very nature, stood out compared to everything else, just because it was the most different. Um, I like it. So that, that, that will be... Uh, uh, so we have a one-two punch of um, of those two tracks of "Rose for Epona" and "Havoc" as our as our songs of the week. Um, I usually but, uh, pitch to you for your uh, your your rating on a scale of one to ten. I'll just lead with this, and I'll say it was a seven point five for me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know that it was uh, an album that I'm going to be dying to go back to, but ironically, I think it will actually make me go back and listen to the band's other stuff that I may have skipped over and see if there's any other gems in there as well. Um, but a, a, overall, just a, an enjoyable listen. And um, 
made me appreciate the band that much more because as I said, I, I thought the last album was phenomenal. What about you? I, I think I'm right there with you. I think a 7.5 is definitely where I'm at as well. And it's definitely um, piqued my interest as far as listening to the, the, the following three albums um, more so than the previous stuff. I, I just think that they kind of are in my in my taste have trended, have been trending upwards since this album and yes. being that this album was as enjoyable as it was, I can only imagine. Um, I don't think I ever actually listened to evocation Two, um, even though I did buy it, I just never really listened to it. And I didn't really listen to much of origins either to be, to be honest, unless Except it was this by week. accident. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I do remember uh, listening to Aten- Atenatos when it came out and really, enjoying it um especially on um that was my favorite track from that album and again it was like all the things that i loved about the album we spoke of today it's that fast um celtic instrument style but with um you know fabian's uh you know vocals and good stuff uh, I, i'm definitely gonna have to go back and and give this another listen but um I think that I just even popped on um, on Biramos again, and and there's definitely you could tell just from this one song that there's more melodicness going on. Yes, hundred um, percent. It's a little less harsh and a little more melodic, and I think that is makes it a little bit more easier to digest on first listen. So, um, yeah, definitely would like to uh, kind of go back and, and give this give this a listen. And uh, it's a, it's an interesting band because I feel like there's not a lot of um, popular metal bands that, that have this sound. And, and this band, like you said, certainly has made their way um, through the States doing headline shows. I think they opened for children of Bodom at, at one point, because I think they played here in Rochester at a, um, a venue that I don't think is open anymore. Um, and I, I kind of on, in retrospect, I wish that I had gone. I think that would have been fun. Um, sucks. That I'll never get to see children of Bodom. Um so, you know, regrets, go to concerts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know when they're uh, when they won't be back, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'm very curious to hear your album of the week for next week. But before we get there, just a couple of news items I, th- I thought were kind of interesting. Number one, uh, Anathema, a band who I just absolutely adore and unfortunately a band who is no more. Um there's been rumors and whispers that a new band, a legacy band, if you will, called Weather Systems, aptly named after the uh, album title from the aforementioned Anathema, is is coming together. And essentially, I saw a news article back in May, which I guess I had missed, but a news article which basically said that Daniel Cavanaugh is, is going to start this new band, Weather Systems. I saw a GoFundMe for... I guess getting that project on track where I guess, you know, they needed the funds to kind of get going. Um, but as a huge anathema fan, I am so curious to see if this, this weather systems projects comes to fruition. I am just, and I, I, I love them. And I think that, uh, any new music from, from the Kavanaugh brothers is something I am always going to, to, to be interested in. You know, I, this is actually the first I've heard that they are no longer a band. So that, is disappointing. Um, I, I thought their last album was not their their best, um, but I mean, I, agree I did. With that. But I did enjoy it, um, and just as I've enjoyed everything, another band, um, much like uh, Poets of the Fall, who we mentioned earlier, that just um, isn't really a metal band, but for some reason grabs the metal audience. I think, and and I purchased their their Blu-ray that, that, that was released uh, a few years ago. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but I just remember thinking to myself like, wow, this is a really, um, just a really musically strong, like really just sonically, um, especially if you have like good speakers and you're listening to in surround sound, like it was a really impressive performance. And, and I was very impressed even though it was not a metal band with um, that Blu-ray in particular. Um, really good stuff. Um, I wanted, I do want to um, 
look up the name of it because I feel like it's it's worth. I believe um, it's called a sort of homecoming, and it's yeah. absolutely phenomenal. But I'm gonna I'm gonna blow your mind, and I'm gonna tell you that if you go listen to the first Anathema album and tell me they're not a metal band, they actually started with death metal vocals. They were a death metal band. And then they transitioned into what you hear now uh, slowly, but they, they certainly got there. And it's amazing when you listen to that early anathema material and you compare it to the stuff that they are most known for, the weather systems uh, and, and other, you know, other, other albums that have come out in like the last couple of years. Uh, not, not least of which is um, We're Here Because We're Here, uh, which recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. Um, that stuff and the newer material, which is, you know, kind of like, uh, just rock or radio rock in many ways is so different to, to albums like Alternative 4 and Eternity, which came out in 1996. Uh, give that a listen and you'll be shocked to hear what they're... I mean, it's it's literally two different bands. Right. And that live um, DVD Blu-ray was uh, actually the one that was released prior to a sort of homecoming, uh, Universal. Oh yeah, um, yeah. That's that's a, that's an absolute gem. Um, yeah, that is my filmed, favorite. It was filmed at the ancient theater of Phil Philip. Oh, I guess I am going to embarrass myself again. <laughs> Phil Philippopolis in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. Um, really, really cool. Um, I completely agree, and the set list is just simply perfect. Yeah, atmospheric. I think. If, if that was atmospheric rock, I, I guess it would be if you wanted to slap a, a genre onto it. But, um, man, I, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's a band I haven't thought about in a while. And, and uh, I mean, the, uh, Weather Systems and Distant Satellites, those two albums really kind of put them on my radar and made me kind of pay attention to uh, what they, what you know, what they were all about. And, and I'm just, you know, I'm glad that I did. And I got one more for you, which will really kind of blow your mind. Uh, Biff, Biff Byford, uh, Saxon vocalist, phenomenal frontman, recently quoted as saying that the early Saxon albums were just as good as Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast. And I, and I just want to say something. I love early Saxon material, much of which came out around the same time, you know, 1982-ish. Um, they've got some phenomenal songs. Princess of the Night is probably one of my favorite songs of all time. That being said, those are big words by Mr. Byford, and I just um, – I, I guess I don't understand why a band like Iron Maiden became stratospheric, whereas Saxon really just never got out of the club scene here in the States, uh, especially as of late. Uh, kind of just two very, very different direct, you know, trajectories for two bands that are kind of similar in many ways, um, but some uh, strong words by Mr. Byford comparing his early material to Number of the Beast. Yeah, um, you know, much like I, I was really hoping that Saxon would be a lot like Pretty Maids for me, where it was one of those bands that I just never got into, and then, um, and then like I would listen to them and become like this huge fan, and th not quite to that level, but I'm so glad that I did because they have so many really great older songs. I think that the difference between them and, um, Iron Maiden is that I feel like at least like from a modern perspective, going back and listening to Saxton, they sounded more like a classic rock band to me than a metal band. Like I felt like it was something that I would have listened to like my mom listening to back in the day when she would listen to classic rock radio, like a Led Zeppelin, like a more of a hard, a classic hard rock band. They're more um, UFO than they are Judas Priest. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that maybe that might have something to do with it. But, man, um, they have some really, really like, denim and leather. And um, just they have a lot of really, really catchy, really good songs. Uh, I'm glad that I was able to give them a chance and, uh, and, and listen to them. And, and actually, I think I had said to you that I did not have any uh, – any news items I wanted to share, but I had forgotten about something and it just popped back into my head. So I thought I would mention it that, um, Martin Westerholt, um, who is kind of the only remaining member of Delane at this point, uh, he's teamed up with uh, Ari's, uh, uh, Johanna Kirkella and, um, have created a band called the eye of Melian. Um, and, uh, it's, um, you know, speaking of like fantasy orchestral music, um, I gave this track a listen, and if you, um, if you're into that Ori 
side project that, um, you know, Tuoma Solopainen uh, did with, um, you know, jo- uh, Johanna, Johanna's his, um, his wife. Uh, she was the vocalist on that. Um, if you if you listen to that or you listen to his solo album, The Music Inspired by the Life and Times of Scrooge, which my friend Caleb absolutely adores that album. It really cracks me up how much he, he likes that. Um, maybe worth going back and giving it a listen after all these years. But uh, I love her vocals, and this is, a, this is very much in that style. It's not a metal song at all. It's actually like a very chill kind of folk tune. But... Um, for the fans of, of you know of uh, symphonic power metal, you know these are some of those names that you might recognize. It's definitely a much like more mellow tune, but uh, the song is called "The Bell," and you can check out the video on uh, YouTube. Nice. I, I've not heard that, but I'll, I'll give it a listen once we're done. Um, but I, I think it's time for the big reveal. We're, we're drawing to the end of 2021. And before I have you announce the album, um, I want to thank everyone that's been listening. We've been getting fans from like all over the world, which is just absolutely um, bananas to me. Uh, people listening from Georgia, and I don't mean the state. I mean the country of Georgia, the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Jordan, Bolivia, Portugal, just to, to name a few. I, I just want to give a shout out to everyone that's listening. We appreciate it. Um, we love hearing from from the listeners. It keeps us going, and, and, and we obviously know you're out there. So thank you. Um, keep the requests coming. We want to hear what you, we want to cover. What you want to hear. Although obviously we enjoy uh, picking our, our own stuff as well, but keep the requests coming. Uh, hit us up on social media. In the links, you will find all of our social media platforms. So definitely reach out to us. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, etc. And we look forward to hearing from you as we as we delve into 2022. What am I listening to this week? I I think I'm gonna give you something that you might not have ever listened to before. I like it. Um, I had, this has been in my head for a while and, and I almost, I came so close two weeks ago or whenever the last time it was my turn to choose and, and I kind of wussed out on it, but now this week is pretty much as good as any week following the passing of Michael Nesmith. You're going to be listening to a monkey's album. Get out um, of here. Okay. I was trying, trying to figure out how the hell to tie this into metal somehow and God bless blabbermouth.net i was scrolling through and sure enough there was a blurb about mike nesmith on blabbermouth.net um paul stanley slash rob zombie kevin noodles wasserman from the offspring charlie benanti and tracy guns all among the uh, heavy metal artists who have re- uh, reacted on social media to the passing of mike nesmith um he died on uh, friday december 10th at the age of 78 i was blessed enough to see him perform live as we mentioned on a previous episode just weeks ago really um and you know it was pretty apparent that he was not in the best of health but um apparently he insisted on doing those shows and i knew the only way i could really get you to listen to something that what you've never heard before would have to be a monkey's album and i had really a pretty hard time deciding which album to choose. And I, and I, I decided to go with um, their, their fourth album, which is called Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited, which I think along with Headquarters, which is their third album, are my two favorite. Those were kind of the two albums that I really, um, that I really wrestled with um, because it comes after the first two albums where they were really just a pop band that was based off of a TV show. And this is, these two albums are when the band started to show a little more, um, that showing the management that they wanted to actually play their instruments and write more songs and stuff. So I think it's a a better representation of the band, um, as, as musicians. So, um, that's given what the, I'm going with. Given the timeliness and given the fact that I've never heard this album, I don't think you could have picked a better choice. Uh, it, it is definitely fitting, and I hope we pay tribute um, to the late Mike Nesmith. This is um, this is fantastic and definitely out of left field, and I feel like <laughs> a, just a perfect way as we get into the end of 2021. Um, excellent choice. Excellent choice. I've got nothing else to say because I ha- I just don't know what to say other than I look forward to uh, listening to this uh, at least a half dozen times during the coming week. Well, I just want to point out that like this was the first band I ever loved as like 
not a teenager, but as like a five or six year old. And, and I'll go into deeper in that when we do the episode. But I also think that a lot of these older metal musicians and hard rock musicians have a strong affinity. And I'm just going to read what Paul Stanley had wrote. And he said, Sometimes it's hard to know why someone's passing hits you a certain way, but this is another one that hit me. I watch my world change as as people that I thought to be timeless pass on, and that is sobering. Lives end and life goes on. Rest in peace, Mike Nesmith. Um, I mean, if you weren't a fan of the band, I mean, um, people that grew up in the late 60s and then the, the revival in the 80s where MTV was replaying all of the episodes of the TV show, which that was what kind of how I became a fan. And again, I'll tell more about that next week or yeah, next week. But um, the TV show is timeless. It's very, I think it's still very funny. Um, But that combination of a sitcom mixed with music uh, was such a a totally different thing. And, And I think the band doesn't get the credit they deserve of making some of the greatest songs ever and had some really fantastic musicianship going on. Um, You know, they've been shunned by the rock and roll hall of fame, but so is iron maiden. So they're in good company. Um, No question about it. So yeah, I uh, I, I look uh, forward to another history lesson through you next week. Yeah. uh, I'm excited to hear what you think just because I know that you are a fan of the Beatles and, and a lot of this music was, was being released right around the same time. And as a matter of fact, this album, I think only spent uh, one week at number one because the Beatles would release uh, like Sgt. Pepper or something the next week and just blow them out of the water, um, whatever it may be. But um, I mean, they, they were, they were pretty in, in, you know, Beatles territory popularity wise back then. But I think that whereas the Beatles kind of maintained this, this, you know, popularity, that's timeless. Um, I think a lot of people kind of forgot about the monkeys and they just kind of became that thing where it was like, Oh, they were just a bunch of actors that played musicians. And I don't think anything could be further from the truth. So I'll probably have a lot to say about that. Looking forward to it. Um, this excellent choice, excellent, excellent choice. Um, we will catch up with you next week. Uh, enjoy uh, going, taking a trip back to 1967 down Remedy Lane. Uh, by Remedy Lane, I mean, you know, Memory Lane. I will uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts, and we will catch you next week with uh, a little tribute to uh, the late great Mike Nesbitt. Awesome. I'm pretty pumped about this. Have a good one, bud. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care.